Hi, Dr. John Cavanaugh, and we're back for part two of lesson five in AJS 101, Introduction to Criminal Justice. All right, let's talk about an arrest. An arrest is the taking into custody of a person, and it begins when the person's freedom to move is curtailed, except in the case of a stop and frisk or an on-the-scene show-up, which are temporary seizures short of an arrest. So you don't have to be handcuffed to be arrested. If the police officer is not letting you leave where you're at, you're technically under arrest. However, again, this does not apply in a stop and frisk situation, uh, stop and question situation. If you're stopped on reasonable suspicion, you can't go away. However, uh, you're not under arrest. The Supreme Court has said that it's less than an arrest, which is why you don't need, the officer does not need probable cause, only needs reasonable suspicion. So even though you can't move away in a stop in question, with or without a frisk, uh, it's not technically an arrest. You can also be forced to stay where you are, not leave, not, stay where you are and not leave for an on the scene show up. Uh, if, if a crime just took place, say somebody got mugged and a description, fairly decent description of the perpetrator is broadcast on the police radio, and somebody is seen uh, a couple of blocks away very soon after the crime occurred that fits that description, the police can stop and detain that person. It's not an arrest, it's a brief detention, and hold that person there until the victim can, can be driven to that location to do a one-on-one -on -one observation to possibly identify the perpetrator. That's an on-the-scene show-up, uh, and that's not considered an arrest. Uh, and of course, if the person did it, he's arrested. If not, the person leaves. But generally, it's an arrest when you can't walk away based on the police saying you can't or, or restraining you or cuffing you or what have you, with those two exceptions. Now, the police need probable cause to arrest and or search. Remember, the Fourth Amendment is very clear. Right? You're protected from unreasonable searches and seizures of you, your person, your places like your home, business, and your things like your possession. And only probable cause can justify uh, a search or a seizure of those things. Now, probable cause is that level of knowledge that would lead a reasonable person to believe that uh, the person has committed a particular crime, right? So it's that level of knowledge that would lead a reasonable person to believe that somebody committed a crime. It's far less than proof beyond a reasonable doubt, which is required for a conviction, but it's more than reasonable suspicion, which simply justifies a brief stop and question. Police officers may search people incident to lawful arrests and the areas in their immediate control and the area in immediate control is generally defined as lunging distance. So if I'm sitting at this desk, the desk can be searched. If there's a little bureau right next to it that I could reach, that can be searched uh, and I can be searched. Right? So the area in the person's immediate control uh, and the person can be searched incident to an arrest. Now, why do the courts allow these searches? I mean, if you're under arrest, why can't you, the, the police hold off on searching uh, until they get a judge to do a search warrant. Well, the courts have ruled that if you've been arrested, uh, it's necessary to protect the police and the public and to prevent escape. So the police can search people incident to a lawful arrest at the time of the arrest and the area in their immediate control to basically recover uh, weapons that might be used to harm the police, to recover property, evidence that may be destroyed, and to recover items that may help in an escape. A person may have a handcuff key in his or her pocket. Uh, so that's why your police were allowed to do a search without a warrant right after an arrest. Police officers may stop and question people they reasonably suspect may be involved in criminal activity. Uh, but the people do not have to answer the questions. So you can be briefly detained and questioned on reasonable suspicion. However, it's important to note that the person who is stopped in question does not have to answer the police questions. Police officers may frisk people they reasonably fear may be armed and dangerous during this stop and questions. Question. And the police must, the people must submit to the frisk. There's no, uh, oh, you can't frisk me. You don't have to answer questions, but you must submit to the frisk because that's officer safety. And by frisk, 
I mean a patting down of the outer layers of clothing uh, to feel for what could be weapons. Uh, the officer can go into a pocket or under clothing if they feel what could be a weapon. They can go in to investigate further or retrieve it. However, if the p p police officer is doing a frisk and feels something that feels like a, an illegal hypodermic needle or uh, drugs, they may not go in and recover that. The police have carved out an exception to the probable cause search uh, to protect uh, the courts, I'm sorry, have carved out an exception to you have to have probable cause to search. They created this lesser infringement, which is not really a search, it's more a frisk, it's a pat down, it's a frisk. So because it's not as intrusive as a search, you don't need probable cause. It's less intrusive than a search, so therefore you just need reasonable suspicion. But they're not going to let the police go on a fishing expedition for drugs and things like that. So for that reason, you can only go into pockets or under clothing if you feel what could be a weapon. This is about protecting the police. Because vehicles are mobile and may be gone, should the police delay a search of a vehicle to get a warrant, it is permissible for police to legally search entire vehicles and their contents uh, it, if, if, if it involves an arrest. In addition, police can search vehicles that they impound to inventory their contents. So when police can seize a vehicle that's uh, blocking traffic, broken down on the street and abandoned, nobody's there, or they may think it's involved in a crime. Uh, they can impound those vehicles and police are, are allowed to thoroughly search any vehicle they impound to get a list of the contents. So that later on, people can't, the per owner of the vehicle can't claim that the property was stolen. And by vehicles, we, we're, we're talking about um, uh, cars, motorhomes, boats, and houseboats. The courts also allow consent searches. Searches made with the permission or the consent of the person. Of consent searches of passengers of common carriers, so long as they are not coerced and the person is not led to believe that the search is mandatory. We used to do this as part of the drug interdiction program at the bus terminal. We would um, hang out at the bus gates of buses going to large upstate state cities where we knew that drug couriers were transporting drugs to. These drug couriers or mules would be put on buses in Buffalo, Rochester, Albany, New York. They would take the buses down to the bus terminal in the, in the morning. They would then go uptown, purchase large quantities of illegal drugs, and they would then come back in the afternoon for the return buses to those cities. We would watch people getting on those buses looking for suspicious activities and, and signs that they were drug couriers. And there are actually some pretty good predictors, but I, I'm not going to tell you because that's not supposed to be public knowledge. But if we had reasonable suspicion that a person could be a drug courier, we were allowed to go on the bus and question them about, you know, what, what's your name? What are you doing here? Um, in an attempt to uh, develop a higher level suspi of suspicion that they were engaged in drug uh, smuggling or being mules. If they answered questions di different ways or lied, uh, that increased our suspicion level and we were then allowed to ask them if we could search their bag. If they said yes and we found drugs, and we often did, we could arrest them and seize the drugs. Uh, but th it could not be coerced. We couldn't make them think that they had to uh, that they had to let, let us search them. We couldn't box them in so they couldn't get up off the bus and leave. So there could be no coercion and they had to believe that the search was voluntary on their part. And if they consented, it was permissible evidence and we made a lot of big drug arrests and we would then interrogate the person. We would ask them where they got the drugs, telling them if they told us, we would tell the DA they helped them, which we did. And we would then get search warrants and we would do raids on the, uh, the drug dens uh, uptown Manhattan. So it was a pretty interesting operation. Um, so let's move on. The intelligence function. The intelligence function involves the police gathering information from victims, witnesses, informants, and suspects. Let's first talk about getting information from informants. Informants are often criminals, and they often get cash or a deal on pending charges in return for information on the criminal activity of others. 
Therefore, informants may be unreliable and have bad motives. These are criminals, so they're not the most reliable people in the world. They have access and contact with other criminals, which is why you're talking to them. And their motive may be to get cash, or their motive may be to uh, get a deal on a pending charge, or, or maybe they want to snitch on a competitor drug dealer and get that drug dealer arrested. So these are not the greatest people in the world. So you have to really take what they say with a grain of salt. However, informants are very useful in police work and perhaps indispensable in the prosecution of organized crime figures or those who commit victimless crimes. Organized crime figures like the mafia, uh, they're very secretive and clandestine and it's almost impossible to get undercover police operatives into their organization. So therefore, you rely on informants, people who work with them, members of the group or, or people who are on the periphery who get information that, they can, that are helpful for the police in making arrests. Uh, informants are also needed in, organ in victimless crime cases, gambling, prostitution, drug dealing, because the people who participate don't come to the police to report the crimes. So you have to get other information to get you into these networks of drug buyers and sellers or, or madams and hookers or what have you. So informants are indispensable in some areas of police work. Let's talk about interrogation. Interrogation is the systematic and planned questioning of a suspect in an attempt to get admissions or a confession. So keywords, systematic and planned. You don't just have a casual conversation with somebody you're interrogating. You, you know about the person, you know about the crime you're investigating. So you sit down and you think about questions, the order of questions. If there's two detectives, one may play good cop, the other bad cop. This is a well choreographed question of somebody, and you're trying to get an admission or a confession. And let's talk about the distinction between an admission and a confession. Everybody thinks interrogations are to get confessions. Well, you don't usually get a confession in an interrogation unless you've got a real stupid or guilty criminal. But you can get admissions. Uh, in an interrogation, the person may admit to being at the location, may admit to owning a gun like that, or better yet, they may offer an alibi which you check out and you discover is false. Now you've caught the person in a lie, which gives you leverage uh, in court about their credibility. Well, you can come back and reinterrogate and say you lied. Now tell me the truth. So confessions, uh, interrogations are not only for confessions. You also try to get statements that you can use against them. Uh, so, so, uh, so interrogation is a systematic and planned question of a suspect in an attempt to get admissions or a confession. It can also include making statements in front of a suspect designed to elicit an incriminating response. Um, so give you an example. You're interrogating somebody, uh, two, two people do a store robbery. You're interrogating the first person in, in, uh, alone without the other person there. Well, you may have your partner come in and lie, and this is allowed, uh, to, and say to you, you don't have to interrogate this guy. His partner just confessed and, and said he was the one who did the, the, the murder and it wasn't him. So we're letting his partner go and this guy is going. And figuring that you might get this person so upset that they'll then say, no, that's a lie. No, he, we both did it. That's not right. So it can be a statement, true or false, in front of a suspect to get an incriminating response from them. Interrogations that involve uh, force, or the threats of force, coercion, threatening to do something bad uh, if they don't confess, like you know, exposing a secret or something, or deprivation of needs like water and food. Those are illegal, and they can exclude, and they and the confession can be excluded from evidence. A confession that is gotten by beating, by threats of beating, by coercion or deprivation of basic human needs like food and water or going to the bathroom, these are questionable because you don't know if the person is confessing because they really did it or because they want the violence or the uh, deprivation of needs or, or they don't want the coercive act performed. So you can't have uh, violence, threats of violence, coercion or deprivation of needs in an interrogation. It would make it illegal. In some instances, sophisticated psychological trickery will also make a confession illegal and excluded from evidence. Uh, uh, the classic case was one that went to the Supreme Court. Uh, there were detectives trying to find the body of a, and the murderer of a murdered young child. 
and they thought they had the suspect and he was under arrest and he was in jail. And while they were transporting him uh, from jail uh, to the court or, or back to, to, to the jail from court, uh, they engaged in psychological trickery to try to find out where the, the young girl's body was found. Uh, they thought it was him, but they couldn't find the body, which is an important part of the case. So the two detectives pretended to talk to each other while the defendant was in the back of the car listening. And they gave the um, a, 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 a sympathetic talk about the Christian burial of the young girl. It's called the Christian burial speech, where they both went back and forth at how horrible it was for the poor family of this dead child because it was almost Christmas and there was snow on the ground and cold outside and they couldn't give their child a decent Christian burial. And they kept up with this theme and eventually the, the criminal got so sad, he was not too bright obviously, that he said, look, I can tell you where the body is. Well, yeah, and he did and the body was there. And that pretty much cinched the case because who else besides the murderer would be able to locate a body you know, in the woods covered with snow? So the court ruled that that type of sophisticated psychological trickery was a beyond reasonable and therefore excluded that confession. Um, under Miranda versus Arizona, anybody suspected of a crime has the right to an attorney, even if they can't afford one, and the attorney may be present during questioning. Uh, in addition, the suspect must be told that anything he or she says can be used against them in a court of law. That is the Miranda warning, right? You have the right to an attorney. Uh, anything you can say can be used against you in a court of law. If you can't afford an attorney, we'll give you one free of charge. Uh, you know, do you understand these rights? You know, will you answer questions? Uh, often, every, everyone knows the Miranda warning, having heard it on TV a zillion times, uh, but the police still must give it before they uh, question somebody when they're trying to get incriminating, uh, uh, when the person's in custody. You only have to give Miranda when the person is in custody, which means they can't leave. They may think they can leave, but if you have enough to arrest them, uh, and when you stop questioning them and they try to leave, you're gonna say, no, you're under arrest, you can't go. Well, they were actually in custody. Custodial interrogations designed to get incriminating information uh, require the reading of the Miranda warning. Miranda rights apply to interrogations. Only a suspect, only once a suspect invokes Miranda, all questioning must stop unless the person later unilaterally waives their Miranda rights. And that waiver must be voluntary and knowing. What this means is if you go to question somebody and they say, no, I want my lawyer, or you start questioning and they stop and say, now I want my lawyer, I don't want to answer any questions, you must stop. They've invoked Miranda. H however, you could go back later on and say, hey, did you change your mind? Oh, no, I'm sorry, I, I got that wrong. <laughs> you cannot go back and say, did you change your mind? The only time you can re-question the person is if they on their own change their mind and they communicate to you maybe through the jailer, that they change their mind and they now want to talk. That is a unilateral wa waiver. In other words, it came from them, not from you. Uh, under the inevitable discovery rule, uh, evidence found as the result of questioning without Miranda rights being read may still be admissible if the police can prove they would have found the evidence anyway. So let's say that you interrogate somebody, you were supposed to give them Miranda, you didn't give them Miranda, therefore what they said is excluded from evidence. And one of the things they said was where the illegal drugs were stashed. Uh, if you could prove as the police officer that you would have found those drugs anyway, uh, then uh, they're still, they'd be admissible, even though you got the information illegally. You know, maybe they were in a locker, and when the locker expired at midnight, it would have been opened by the authority, uh, by the, the bus terminal people where the locker was. They would have discovered it, called the police, and you would have found out. That's inevitable discovery. Maybe it's a body, you know, covered by snow, and when the snow melted, uh, when the sun came out, the body would suddenly have, you know, been visible and reported. Those would be inevitable discovery exceptions. Uh, there's also a public safety uh, exception. Under the public safety exception rule, the police do not have to read Miranda rights to a suspect if public safety is at risk and reading Miranda might make the person be quiet, not talk, uh, and jeopardize public safety. So let's say we're talking about a, a terrorist bomber or a crazy bomber, right, who's planted a bomb and you apprehend him or her. Uh, if you read the Miranda, they may actually not tell you where the bomb is, and that would jeopardize public safety. 
So in that case, the police don't have to use Miranda warnings uh, before they question the person. Public safety exception. Now, Miranda only has to be read when people are in custody and the police question them. Police do not have to read Marie Miranda when the question, when, when they question uh, victims uh, or, or witnesses, or when suspects speak to them without absent police um, inter uh, questions. So if a, per if a suspect speaks to you on their own without you having asked a question, then you would not have to have Miranda, even though they may be in If a prisoner speaks to you without your answering question, ask them a question, then that would not be a violation of Miranda. You're not interrogating them. They're just opening their big mouth and talking. And by the way, prisoners do a lot of that. Uh, you know, half the time you want to say to people, you have the right to remain silent, shut up and use it. I'm tired of listening to your, your babbling. Okay, let's talk about gathering special non-testimonial evidence. Special kinds of non-testimonial, and we're talking about physical evidence here, uh, include body parts, fluids, and fingerprints. This evidence is very personal and is protected by the Fourth Amendment, uh, the right to privacy. The courts are hesitant to force people to give fingerprints or to allow surgical invasion of the body to get biological evidence. Uh, so generally, if you don't want to be fingerprinted, you, you don't. You, you, you can't identify yourself and you're under arrest. You may sit in jail a long time because you're not going to get bail. But uh, usually you can't force fingerprints. There are some exceptions there. And uh, for the most part, uh, invasions of the body to get biological evidence are also prohibited, like drawing blood or, or, or DNA. Generally, warrants must be acquired to, the, to permit body intrusions, and surgeries are generally prohibited. So there may be a warrant to get DNA evidence, uh, but if there's a bullet in, 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 in a, uh, say a police shot a robbery person as, who escaped and you have somebody you think is that person, and if you could retrieve the bullet because you found them in a, in a hospital, you could link it to the police officer's gun and you would know it was that person. Well, that's a surgery. And generally the court said a surgical invasion uh, for legal reasons is beyond uh, the, the scope of a reasonable search and seizure, so you can't do it. Strip searches and body cavity searches are allowed in prisons, but in other situations, probable cause is required and medical personnel are required to do the, the, uh, the body cavity searches. Before uh, the courts ruled that we couldn't routinely strip search prisoners, we used to strip search everybody we arrested uh, who was going to be put into the cell area. And it was a nasty uh, process. I mean, you would bring the prisoner into the cell area. They'd stand uh, by the door of the cell and you would tell them to take off uh, each of their items of clothing and hand it to you, which you would then search until they were totally, um, totally naked. <laughs> and then you tell them to turn around, bend over and spread their cheeks. And I don't mean these cheeks, I mean the other cheeks, uh, to make sure they weren't concealing anything uh, in, in their rectum. Uh, prisoners will often conceal contraband, well, usually drugs, in their rectum. They often use those individual plastic cigar holders. So you would tell them to bend over, spread their cheeks, and cough, and this would usually cause anything inside to project outward. Uh, sometimes prisoners, uh, male prisoners, obviously, would, uh, would hide contraband under their testicles. Uh, I had one prisoner who I had finished strip searching and uh, he was putting his clothing back on. He slipped and he kind of stumbled and I heard the rattling like a Tic Tac container. And I said, wait a minute. I said, I said, jump up and down. And as he jumped, I heard the Tic Tac rattle. I said, wait a minute, what's going on here? So I, I, I told him to lift up those, those testicles and he had taped under his testicles a prescription bottle containing illegal drugs. So that's why you have to do strip searches. But the courts have ruled that, uh, that, that you have to have a probable cause to believe the person is hiding contraband to do a strip search. You can't just routinely do it to everybody, which is a good policy. But in prisons, they can do it a lot more because they have much more uh, of a need to maintain uh, order and keep weapons and discipline out of the prison population. So they can pretty much do strip searches whenever they want to. But again, body cavity searches have to be done on probable cause and medical personnel need to do that. Uh, finally, electronic eavesdropping. 
The police must generally have, what do you think, to get a search warrant, to tap phones and other electronic communication devices, or plan bugs, hidden microphones, or otherwise eavesdrop in places where people have a reasonable expectation of privacy. What do the police need for the warrant? Right, probable cause. That's the uh, Fourth Amendment. So the police have to have probable cause to tap a phone, plant an electronic microphone, hidden microphone somewhere, uh, or eavesdrop in places where people have an expectation of privacy. So where do you have an expectation of privacy? Well, obviously in your closed room, your closed office, your home, your car. Uh, you don't have an expectation of privacy standing in an open phone booth or it's talking to somebody in a restaurant or bar. Uh, in the old days, phone booths had closing accordion doors. You see them in the old movies. There you would have an expectation of privacy. Uh, but in an open phone booth, you don't. Um, in the, uh, at a urinal, you don't have an expectation of privacy in a men's room. But in a, a men's or ladies' room, in a stall with the door shut, you have an expectation of privacy. So uh, that's kind of the rules about that. If there's an expectation of privacy, you have to have a warrant to eavesdrop or plant bugs or other devices. Uh, however, taps, which uh, are like uh, phone taps, are sometimes allowed when third party consents, although state laws may make such acts crimes. I believe in Arizona, if one party consents to recording, it's legal to record, even if the other party doesn't know about this. Uh, when you do have uh, the right to do a uh, eavesdrop, wiretap, what have you, officers cannot listen in on non-criminal conversations for lengthy periods of time. Uh, if you're tapping a phone, when the phone, uh, uh, when a person picks up the phone uh, to either make a call or answer a call, the officer is allowed to listen to the conversation. If it is a non-criminal conversation, after a minute or two, they must turn off the recorder and keep it off for several minutes. They can periodically go back every few minutes and listen briefly to see if the conversation has turned to a criminal topic. But if it hasn't, even if they have a warrant, they can't listen in for extended lengths of time on personal non-criminal uh, conversations. All right, so that ends the electric eavesdropping and it also coincidentally ends lesson five. So now is the time to uh, get all of your, your notes uh, together and uh, take the lesson five test. Good luck.